We, we're very excited to get started with the, the lecture. I just wanted to welcome everybody to um, the next um, Healthy Aging at Tufts University seminar. Um, and I'm going to just ask Alan, I'm Roger Fielding, the uh, Associate Director of the HNRCA. I'm just going to invite Alan Taylor up to introduce our speaker, and we can get started. Thank you. So I want to thank Roger and the OVPR and the Healthy Aging Program at Tufts for putting together the support for this fabulous lecture series. Um, I have four announcements before I introduce David. Um, one is that the next speaker, Vera Gorbanova, will speak about cell senescence and epigenetics. So you'll see a theme coming through here. Um, and that's on March 13th. Um, on March and February 20, 27th, next week, Fred Goldberg will be speaking about uh, prote proteolysis and the use of proteasome inhibitors in disease. He's a, a legendary figure in, in the world of ubiquitin community in proteasome. Um, next fall, we'll be having this course on the biology of aging taught by Mitch McVeigh and myself. And um, pilot grants for the aging program are due on February 28th, so right quick, get money, and do more aging research. So, today it's my absolute pleasure to, to introduce Dr. David Sinclair. He's a tenured professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School. He's the co-director of the Paul Glenn Center for the Biology of Aging that puts on a fantastic aging symposium for those of you who don't know about it, you should know about it. Um, it's free and really the luminaries of the world show up there in terms of the speakers, even some of the people who attend. Um, he's a conjoint professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. I guess he must hail from Australia. Um, and um, I, there's a lot of mis misunderstandings on my part. I think OA, I thought, oh, it must be an optometrist of America. But I mean, he's a fellow of Royal Society in Australia. So he worked with Lenny Garanti at MIT, where he discovered that the fidelity for two instructors is required um, to age maximally, which is, shall we say. He's also worked on NAD precursors and other epigenetic modifiers with regard to aging. Um, at the ripe old age of 29, he was recruited to Harvard Medical School and shortly thereafter became the founding director of the Paul Glenn Laboratories for Aging Research, um, a group that includes four labs at Harvard and a consortium of 11 universities. And we would like to be one, just you want to know. Um, he's published only 187 papers and he's been cited only 60,000 times. Um, there's quite a standard you're holding us up to. I'm not sure we'll measure up, but we'll try. He serves as the co-chief editor of Scientific Journal Aging, has received, received 35 honors. On his honors page is longer than my publications page. He includes being one of Australia's leading scientists, um, been listed in the Australian Medical Research, got the Australian Medical Research Medal, the NIH Director's Pioneer Award. He's been listed in Time Magazine in 2014 with the 100 most influential people in the world. Um, and he's listed as the top 50 people in healthcare in 2018. So we're very lucky to have David here. Um, I, I personally can now fade into the sunset, um, professionally, so to speak, because he just published a paper last month that set me back a few years. So the reversal of aging induced, reversal of aging induced vision loss. Um, so he's already done everything we've been trying to work on for the last lifetime. And for those of you, just in case you want to get the point summarized briefly, for those of you who forgot um, that you, you can recall your youthful DNA, he's going to be speaking about the epigenetics of aging, or you could call this talk Back to the Future, I guess. Um, so you'll hear more about his fascinating work in just a moment, and let's put our hands together and welcome Dr. David. Thanks, Al. Is that too loud for you? It's okay? Right. You can understand my audio accent okay, I know. Uh, and thank you, Roger, for having me here. Thank you all who invited me. Um, when I saw the list of other speakers, uh, it, it was a, a no-brainer to, uh, to accept this invitation. It's a real honor to be listed among them. Uh, but I noticed that George Church, uh, was it last week? Was it? A couple of weeks ago talked about the genetics of aging, and I'm talking about the epigenetics of aging, so it's a church versus Sinclair battle going on here. Um, and I hope that I'm going to convince you that it's possible that the epigenome is more important for your long-term health than your genome. 
Uh, so, yeah, I've been studying uh, aging for a while. Uh, Mitch McRae is here, my old friend from the Garanti Lab. I was a young postdoc who was a young graduate student in those days. And we were studying yeast cells at a time when a couple of things were pretty obvious to us. One was that aging research got no respect. Um, that changed just a little bit, um, as you all know. And the other thing that happened uh, was that we uh, were working on an organism uh, that most people didn't think would be that relevant to human aging, but we were of the belief at Lenny Gorenti's lab at MIT that this little humble yeast fungus would tell us something about, um, if not why we aged, uh, perhaps uh, what maybe there's something we could do about it. Um, and it's in a long way. What I'll tell you about today is that the lessons we learned in those days, in the late 1990s, are extraordinarily and surprisingly relevant uh, I think, to why we age, um, and even, um, do I say it, why eventually uh, we, we don't have to. Uh, maybe not in our generation, but future generations, I think, will make much more uh, more of an advance than we have. If I skip over here, is that still okay? Good. Now I'm mobile. Much more dangerous. Um, so there are lots of causes of aging. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you about all of them, but I am going to stand up here um, and um, allay your uh, concerns that I'm going to say there's only one cause of aging. Um, clearly, there are many different causes, and we've got the whole pie chart of the hallmarks of aging, which clearly play major roles in the aging process, from autophagy, uh, or lack of autophagy, through to stem cell loss, telomeres, uh, DNA uh, instability and mutations. And the list goes on. And as themselves, I could, I could fill up an hour talking about those, but I won't because there's one part of that wheel, those hallmarks of aging, that I think, and I'll put to you controversially, um, may be a major driver of all those other things that happen. And that's what my talk is about today. Uh, so, you know, I'd like to be controversial, so, you know, bear with me. Keep an open mind. This is all just for discussion purposes. I've been thinking about aging since I was four years old. Um, and thanks to a lot of the yeast work that we did in the Gorenti lab, it actually occurred to us that information was important during aging. And you've probably all heard of sirtuins, but you may not recall that the first three letters of sirtuins stand for silent information regulator. And finding that silk proteins were involved in yeast aging, and now we know uh, in mammals, the middle word, information, I think, has been screaming at us um, for way too long. But I think we, we need to come back to that. So if I distill what might be aging down to, into an equation, it would look like this. This is aging, I think. Uh, this is the loss of information due to entropy. Claude Shannon um, came up with a lot of this mathematics. So who's Claude Shannon? Uh, if you don't know him, he, he's the reason that we have phones uh, and many supercomputers in our pocket. He was at MIT in the 1940s and 50s um, and came up with the mathematics that described how to communicate in a lossless fashion. So, and this is from a paper that I love. It's called The uh, Mathematical Theory of Communication. And I think that this is very relevant to aging, as you'll see. Uh, but what he showed in his paper, it's a beautiful paper if you look at it, is that there are, there's a transmitter of information and a receiver. In, the, in those days, they were talking mostly about radio signals and the loss of lives in World War II due to miscommunication. And he said, there's always noise, um, always. And particularly, it's a problem if it's an analog signal for anyone who's owned uh, a cassette player and tried to copy one after another. But he came up with the mathematics that said, there's a way to always have a perfect signal. And what you need to do is to have a backup copy. You know, these days we take it for granted, but in those days this was a novel idea. And he backed his ideas up with some mathematics as well. He didn't call it a backup hard drive or a backup copy, he called it an observer. And the observer takes the original message and stores it, and if the receiver doesn't get the full message, the receiver says, okay, give me what is missing, and you then correct the entire message. Um, this gave rise to the, uh, the TCP IP protocol that runs the internet today. And now we get emails every time. We get photos every time. Um, 
although I do remember a time when emails weren't perfect and you could pretend that you didn't receive an email. Uh, but unfortunately, the mathematics in the system is so good now that this happens. So what is, how is this relevant to aging? Well, I put it to you that when we are conceived and we go through development, we are setting up a, an information system that gets us through our lives. And there are two types of information in biology that are extremely important. Not the only two, but the two main ones. Uh, we all know about DNA, and this is uh, a, a beautiful digital format, ACTG. Um, it's not binary, it's quaternary, but it's essentially uh, one of four different letters. Uh, but the other type of information, we lump into a term called epigenetics, which if I was describing to my children, I would say, that's the system that tells the genome how to be read and how, to, how we stay uh, have functional cells. And that almost all cells have the same genome, and what distinguishes a nerve cell from a liver cell is this epigenome. And you all know, I don't need to tell you, that the epigenome is made up of different bundles of DNA that interact differently, uh, depending on the, the cell type. Um, this is all known, but we're starting to finally get the tools to be able to understand the epigenome um, in, in its actual existence, not just theoretical or on a Western blood. Uh, so there are, I'll tell you technologies that we're using that are just coming online. Some of them are actually just going to be released next week um, at a conference I'll be at called AGPP. And these allow us to look at and map the epigenome um, increasingly at a single cell level, uh, but also in four dimensions very accurately, even down to the nucleosome level. So finally, we're getting a picture of what is going on in disease and during aging. And what I'm proposing, thanks to some youth work that I'll tell you about, is that when we're young and we're going through development, we've got a beautiful genome from our parents, hopefully. And we also have a beautiful epigenome that turns on the right genes in the right tissue at the right time. And when we're hungry, it all works. And when we exercise, it all works. But what I think is going on during aging is, in large part, it's that this beautiful uh, epigenetic information is lost over time. And you end up with cells that have partially lost their identity. And they don't function like they used to. So that's a, a nice theory. This actually dates back to the late 1990s. This is from a, a review from CMI, our colleague at, the, at MIT. Um, sometimes when I teach this, I use the analogy of a compact disc. Uh, for anyone who's young, uh, this was some amazing device you could put about 20 songs on. It was awesome at the time. But uh, it's a good analogy for, I think, aging, because it, a lot of the information is still intact in old cells. Yes, there are mutations, but aging is surprisingly reversible um, in many tissues. We've reversed it uh, in muscle, in blood, uh, in the endothelial lining of blood vessels, uh, in the eye, as Alan kindly mentioned. So I think aging is more like a scratch compact disc or a DVD, in that if we could just polish that, we could get back to a cell that could read the genes the right, the right way. But of course, that's not how we're built. We are, instead, we are a composite of loops and bundles of DNA. And uh, Waddington first, in the 1950s, proposed this metaphor, which is that a uh, fertilized cell or a fluoropotent stem cell would go down this hill, what we call the Waddington landscape, and land in a different valley, depending on the type of cell that it was meant to be. And we know that now this valley is represented by loops of DNA um, that are called tags. And at the base here, we have a protein complex of cohesin and CTCF, among other proteins. And this is really a, the real uh, physical representation or, or feel, uh, reality of this representation that Waddington came up with. And what you can see here in this diagram from this review that I've stolen uh, is that cell type A has a different type of looping uh, than cell type B. And what I'm proposing to you is that the structure of the epigenome and these loops and perhaps the contacts made between different regions of the genome, either short range or long range, is what's largely going wrong during aging, leading to just cell dysfunction and ultimately 
cellular senescence, and possibly even cancer as well. Okay. So I think that that's pretty clear. What was disappointing about uh, the Waddington landscape is that it was used by developmental biologists who were studying the beginnings of life, but they didn't really think about the end of life, which is what we work on. Um, and so instead, if you, if you extended this out into the future, what I think is going on is that these hills and valleys become smooth, smoothened so that cell types don't stay in these nice valleys. And we call this epigenomic noise, which is a new term that, that we use in the lab. And this, this process of, of aging and loss of cellular identity we've called X differentiation. And of course, if, if you can somehow get those cells to go back to their original valleys, would that be age reversal? Um, yeah, so that question mark's important. What drives that process? And then the other one is, can you reverse it? Is there a backup copy? Is there an observer of our use? And the other thing that I think you all know about, but I just want to remind you, is that we now have a very accurate way of determining biological age, thanks to Steve Horvath and, and many others that he, he gets to name the clock, the Horvath clock. And what we do now is pretty easy. It costs a few hundred bucks. It's probably going to cost 10 bucks uh, in, in a year or two. We can measure the, read the methylation pattern at certain regions that predict, predictably change with age. Um, and there are even universal clocks for all the tissues in a mouse or a human. So that's interesting, right? You can, I could take your blood and tell you roughly when you're going to die, what year, maybe even what month. If you don't get hit by a bus, that is. Um, but what's also interesting is that this is actually a clock. Why is DNA methylation predictably changing? Now, it's not all the methylation sites. It's only a subset of a few thousand. But what is particular about those sites? We don't know yet. And what we don't know is if this is just a a clock, or is it really age? In other words, if this was a clock on the wall, one up the back, if I move the hands of that clock, time isn't going to go backwards. But what if I change that clock? Does age go backwards? And I'll get to that later. But just going pretty quickly, because I have a lot to tell you, uh, this is some of the work that we did in the Grinty Lab, and, and Mitch was involved in this. Uh, we said that genome instability and DNA breaks that were occurring in the yeast cell did something particular. The, ye the circles that form from genome instability eventually kill the yeast cell. And Mitch actually showed that if you stop these circles from forming, you get long-lived yeast cells. But there's something else that happens to these cells that's really interesting and I think um, just as relevant to our aging process. So to orient you, uh, the blue is the nucleus. This was the original sirtuin. Uh, that gave the name so two, and it's a, a histone uh, deacetylase, and it compacts chromatin, and it's found in the nucleolus where the repetitive RDNA is found. And you can see that these circles in this new cell have popped out, and they tend to replicate and stay within the original cell, so they accumulate exponentially. But what's important for this talk is that something else happened that we didn't really pay a lot of attention to at first, but it turns out to be important, and that is that this these other loci are silent. They're meant to be kept silent, and they determine cell identity, A or alpha, male or female yeast cells. Um, and uh, I could talk more about telomeres up here, but I won't. But I think telomeres are involved in this as well. Um, but what you can see in this schematic is that because of genome instability down here at the RDNA locus, the fur protein and the complex of proteins moves to try and stabilize the genome. They have two roles. One is silencing, making sure cells maintain their identity. And the other role is repairing broken DNA. And the problem in yeast cells is that when you lose your, lose your silent information, uh, you, not only do you get confused, you're an A and an alpha, but you lose the ability to mate. And a hallmark of yeast aging uh, is sterility. Okay, so a yeast cell, an old yeast cell, before it's dead, will become sterile prematurely because it's lost its identity. And so I think that that's a, a, a very simple version of what happens in our bodies as we get older. Now, a clue to that came in 1999 when Kevin Mills and Lenny and I came up with this paper. 
Um, others also published something very similar, Susan Gasper and Steve Jackson's lab as well. But basically what we proposed in this paper was that uh, the third complex, uh, which is, as I mentioned, that silent low side in our DNA, gets distracted by double-stranded DNA break, which are very toxic for the cell. If you don't repair a double-strand break, you're toast. Um, and so what happens is the third complex goes to the break. We now know it plays a really important role in stabilizing the ends and recruiting repair factors. We know that it's an active recruitment because if you get rid of the DNA damage checkpoint, they don't move, they stay where they are. Um, but essentially, we think that this now is an important driver of the aging process. The distraction of the serotonin by DNA double strand break. Okay, so we then went on to mammals, and Philip Oberdorfer was the postdoc who led this study. We published this actually over a decade ago now. Um, and what we, we showed in cells and uh, in the brain of mice that something similar happened in mammals. And hopefully, this will play. Okay, so the, the narration is something like this, that proteins are regulating genes and protecting telomeres, and every time we get a double-stranded break, these proteins move to help repair that break. Um, and our idea from this paper was that they don't always go back to where they came from, and they eventually end up at other places, disrupting the epigenome and leading to changes in gene expression that are deleterious. And we showed that this does happen in cells that we damage um, and also those same genes were coming on in the brain of mice. But it took us a decade to get to the next question, which was if we cause this to happen in cells, um, living cells and in an animal, what happens? And the prediction is that you'll get something that resembles aging. And not just a mouse that looks old, but all the hallmarks of aging should also happen if it's upstream of all the others. So you should see increased cell senescence, loss of stem cells, etc. So uh, this is the work of many, many people. I hope I'll uh, remember the main ones, but it was, the mouse was made by Philip Oberdorfer and has been analyzed uh, by Jay Chun Yang at the cellular level mainly, and the mice were uh, Matoshi Hayano and Louis Reisman. But now it involves uh, about 15 lab work. And uh, we put these up on BioArchive if you'd like to see them, um, and we're wrestling with uh, editors at the moment. Okay, so does the response to DNA damage induce changes to chromatin that drive aging is the question. So to test this, we made these mice, which we call ice mice, for inducible changes to the epigenome or to epigenetics. And we could also take cells from either the embryos or the adults and uh, do a lot more with the cells. Um, so the ice system was pretty difficult to engineer, but uh, we were lucky to um, succeed. And what we were hoping to do was to have nice control over where and when the cuts happen. Uh, we don't want any mutations, right? If we're just crashing the genome and causing cancer, that's not going to be very easily interpreted. The cuts should be in non-coding regions, preferably. It shouldn't be, shouldn't induce a DNA damage checkpoint. We don't want cells to arrest or die. Um, and we, were mani we managed to do that. So how did we do that? There's an enzyme called TPO1 that comes from a slime mold, um, and it cuts, it recognizes, I should say, about 19 sites, although there's more than that because it's also, there's a cut site at the ribosomal DNA, which of course has many copies. But in practice, we find that it only cuts about three times um, regularly in a, in a cell, and it doesn't leave mutations. Okay, we sequence very deeply in the cells and in the animal. We don't see any increase in mutations either across the whole genome or even at the cut site. Okay, so the system works really well. Uh, it works using tamoxifen. We can feed the cells or feed the mice tamoxifen and induce these cuts for as long as we want or as short as we want. And it can also be tissue specific. So the mice that I'm going to show you are whole body induction, uh, but we also have brain specific mice. We call these the neuronal eyes or the nice mice. And we're hoping that actually we've already started. We show that these mice have evidence of, uh, of dementia, um, but that's for a future story. What I want to tell you about is what, what goes on when we do this in the whole body of a mouse. Um, I also want to tell you about Jay's work um, 
the postdoc who's been doing this for a few years in cell culture. So these are primarily NEC results, mouse embryonic fibroblasts. And what Jay does is he induces this cutting for 24 hours and then lets the cells recover. And at, you know, at a later time point, he asks, is there any memory of those cuts before? So he, he knows that there's no, dam no uh, lasting DNA damage here. He can measure that. There's no mutation. But are these cells fundamentally different by any measure than they were a few days before? Okay, you understand the question here? Most textbooks would say there's no difference between these cells and these cells. If there's no mutation, the cell's quite happy. It turns out that's not true. There is a memory of DNA repair, even if there's no mutation left behind. Uh, I won't show you this, but also if you're wondering, these cells are also primed to eventually senesce. So we think this is part of a pre-senescent state. Uh, this just really shows how the system works. I'll go quickly. Uh, you see an increase in the number of uh, DNA damage foci. For the background, we set it one. We just call it one. And then it goes up about three to four fold over 24 hours. Um, and then it goes away back to zero. So it's all working well. We look at foci. We can measure the, the cut sites now by uh, precipitating those sites with a primer uh, or probe. And again, just to remind you, the question is, are these cells here that have recovered and their descendants any different than these here? Um, and so we threw all my NIH grants at this problem. Um, and I'll show you some of the data. It's really, really interesting. I'm going to mention a number of things. You know what RNA-seq is. Uh, you probably know high c looking at long-range contacts between chromosomal regions. Um, ATAC-seq is very similar looking at structure of the chromatin. CHIP-seq is proteins that are modified uh, that bind chromatin. One that you may not be familiar with is a, a new technology called high chip which is a combination of chip seq and high c So we can get interactions and protein information at the same time. And that is uh, some of the most cutting edge work that I'll show you today. So let's do the easy stuff, rna seq gene expression. All right, this is before cutting and after cutting. Actually, I, I stand corrected. This is the control, which just has the CRE. Uh, and then this has the CRE plus the PPO. So they've both been induced by tamoxifen, and then but this one was never cut, and these ones were cut. And you can see that there's a difference in gene expression between these two uh, experiments. And of course, we do it, in, in, we've done it many, many times. What's interesting is if you take mouse fibroblasts that are from an older mouse, so 12, 12 months, the pattern of gene expression is closer to the eye cells. But remember, these are in culture, and they've been induced only for 24 hours. And now we're saying, remarkably, almost unbelievably, that they resemble having been in a mouse for 12 months. So that was the first clue that we're on to the right thing. This is before we ever had a DNA methylation clock. What about the, the topology of the chromosome? Uh, so this is uh, the large part of chromosome 6, um, not all of it. And so are there any changes in compartmentalization? Are these loops changing or parts of those loops touching different parts? And so this is a high C topology map. And for the most part, the I cells in red don't look very different from the control, the pre cells. Now we can map the changes in histone acetylation. This is H3K27. And there are some pretty big differences um, in certain regions. Um, and so these are all individual genes down here. So this is a big region. But there are dozens of regions in the genome after cutting that are different and making different contacts. And I'll just blow one up because it's hard to see. There's, there's one of them. This is just an average one. There are you know, some that are much more obvious. But you can see three repetitions of the experiment are in red, and the blue are another three. So what's going on at these stars? these epigenetic stars. So we have some idea now what's going on. And these represent, to me, at least in concept, the, similar to the mating type loci in old yeast cells, where the sirtuins or perhaps other factors left their home and gotten distracted by DNA damage. Okay, so let's figure out what's going on here. So I'm now going to hit you with a figure from the paper, which is basically what professors do when they're too lazy to make a nice picture. Um, 
I don't expect you to absorb all this, but it, it gives me a chance to point out some things that I think are important points. Uh, one is that we start to see that these nests uh, resemble other cell types. So they're starting to lose their identity. That's one point. The other is when we look at the uh, super enhancers that specify cell types, they start to lose their super enhancers that are specific to fibroblasts and start to take on other super enhancers. Uh, which you can see across the whole genome averaged out uh, of the control in blue and the I cells in red. Uh, we can zoom up on particular loci. Uh, the I cells are in red. You can see that at these couple of genes, there's changes in histone uh, methylation. And interestingly, these are genes that control uh, neuronal specificity. And we actually find, or Jay finds, that you can differentiate these I cells much more easily into neurons, whereas the control cells have a better, let's call it, epigenetic memory that they should be a fibroblast. If we look across the entire genome of the, the cells, what we see is this smoothening of the epigenetic landscape, such that you know, if we just take H, uh, H3K27 acetylation, um, those areas that had a lot of acetylation start to lose it, and those that had little acetylation start to gain it. And you can see the difference. The blue means that uh, the cells lost, and red means they gained H3K27. So if we, again, zoom up to a particular region, this, this is a, a set of genes that we love to work on now, because it, it's not just highly reproducible, it's just really interesting. Um, so you all remember what the Hox gene before, specifying your head from the tail during development. These genes have no business being messed with in, in an adult. You do not want this. But here we see in these cells, um, and also in the adult uh, animal, that genes that are involved in embryogenesis and differentiation and cell type specificity, those Waddington landscapes, are getting disrupted pretty badly. In this case, just by 24 hours of non mutagenic cutting. Uh, so I'll just mention that uh, this is the Hoxae locus. You can see uh, they become dysregulated. Genes at the, the proximal end go down. You can see that in RNA seq as well, with this blue region. Um, and at this other end, it goes up. Okay, and you can see that here with RNA seq. Uh, that also happens at Hox B, Hox D. The Hox loci are pretty sensitive to these disruptions, and we think that this is a model for what's going on in, during aging. Uh, and you can also do chip so you can see that uh, there are uh, big changes in. Uh, H3K27 acetylation, uh, in K56 acetylation, and K27 trimethyl, trimethylation. Um, and in particular, you can see that the Cree cells, which are the control, uh, have a lot of methylation, whereas they lose it here uh, after the recovery from damage. We don't see a big difference in CGCF, um, if you're wondering. So we don't think the big difference is that, the, that these CAD loops are all coming undone. It's more subtle than that. We had to develop some technology to really dig in to see what's happening. And this is where uh, this new technology called high chip comes in handy. Um, and I, I want to give credit to uh, members of the lab, Daniel Vera, Jay, I mentioned earlier, um, and there's a group uh, called Dovetail Genomics that has worked for the last two weeks on this data and actually sent it to me on the way here. So this is data that I'm going to uh, present at this uh, genomics conference next week. And um, it's hot off the presses, so go easy on me. But what we think we see, again, using high C, looking at the tags, there's not a lot of changes between the control and the ice recovered cells. You can see a little bit, you can squint, and maybe we'll see something um, down the line. But it's not obvious. Now, just to remind you, we're looking at this Hoxae locus. But here, look at this. The high chip is actually telling us uh, more short range interactions within the Hoxae locus, which is here, and adjacent genes, which is here. Okay? So you can see, actually, in this case, the Cree cells, uh, the control cells, have a lot of great interactions from the Hoxae locus down to this area here, step two. This is probably a, um, a distal promoter or an enhancer. And what happens after the, the damage and recovery is that you start to disrupt 
these interactions. And in the case of the Hoxay locus, you're now making more contacts as well. Another interesting thing that we're seeing are particular changes. Um, where is it? Oh, that's coming in the next slide. But you can see here when you look at K27 acetylation, look at the massive changes at this locus. Again, half of it goes down and half of it goes up. Um, both acetylation and also the, you know, here's this new methylation that appears. Okay, but I was telling you that this doesn't just happen at Hox A. What about Hox B? So now this is looking at Hox B. And what we see at Hox B, here are the various Hox genes here, down here. This is a, an unrelated gene called GAP1. And what you see is that GAP1 has this new uh, enhancer that we've discovered uh, that sits right here in one of the, the introns. Um, it's right here. And what we've got here are these interactions going away after the recovery. So this is essentially uh, lost these interactions between these adjacent regions. And these, and these promoters, or let's call them short-range enhancers here, have also been lost. And we see corresponding changes in the histone acetylation, histone methylation, and uh, not so much gene expression. But what we also think is that these genes uh, are now primed to change their gene expression. Because actually what, what Jay told me on the way here is that this, um, the pre is a super enhancer because it, it's got um, particular marks such as uh, K4-methyl, but it hasn't been activated by acetylation yet. So this is pre or poised to become uh, disrupted. All right, but now let me just finish up with uh, some in vivo work. So I've shown you that DNA cutting, even if it doesn't make a mutation, will disrupt gene expression. Um, but what does that do to an animal? Well, we, we do the experiment in the following way. We take like six mice that are either have just the CRE or just the PPO enzyme um, or nothing, wild type. And then the fourth one is the interesting one that has both the Cree and the PPO. They all get tamoxifen for three weeks um, when they're young, at five months of age. And actually nothing happens. When we first did this experiment, we were pretty disappointed. They just walk around as if they just had a major dental x-ray. You don't feel that either. But what we started to see was over time, after one month, we could start to see that the experimental animals lost a bit of hair on their nose, the gray hairs were showing up. And 10 months later, they looked like that. Remember, these mice are genetically identical. In this case, they're just brothers and sisters. But they're hugely different. They have whole physiology that looks like aging, histology, gene expression, um, and even memory loss. So first, I'll, this is a bit of uh, new data, but it's interesting. Now we can do high C on the animal and look at how the chromosomes are interacting. So this is, uh, in this case, this is the chromosome 11. And just to cut to the chase, where it's green, you can probably can't see, uh, things uh, becoming more, more in contact in the old mouth. But there's very little gain of interaction. What we're seeing is a loss of interaction in the red. Okay, and this is, um, I think, the whole of chromosome 11 is shown here. But there are regions that are supposed to be in contact in the muscle, but you lose them. We think that that's one of the problems during aging is that the, the ability of chromosomes to contact the right region, both between chromosomes and, and in this case within the chromosome, is being lost. And this gets except, remember, this is not the ice mouse. This, in this case, this is the wild type animal. So we can mimic this with our accelerated aging models, the ice mice. So getting back to the ice mice, this is again is, is too much data for a slide, but to hit some of the high points, uh, the, the ice mice, uh, we measure their frailty and they are older based on that. They have metabolic changes, this is their circa uh, respiration and circadian rhythms, their motion, they get kyphosis. Essentially, every time we give a tissue or an organ to another lab, um, they come back and say this is pretty close to, to aging. But this doesn't prove anything, right? It could just be a very, very sick mouse, um, even though we've looked at these for 10 years. 
So let's, let's do some more molecular work here. Gene expression. It doesn't just happen in the cells, it happens in the animal. So this is gastrocnemius, skeletal muscles, gene expression of the, uh, the top few hundred genes that go up or down in the ice mass prematurely compared to it, the brothers and sisters. Um, and now they're looking more like uh, a much older mouse. Remember, these ice mice are only 16 months, but they look more like a 24-year-old mouse, month-old mouse. What about the clock? Finally, we have mouse clocks. We developed our own clocks, actually. If anyone wants, wants to collaborate, um, definitely reach out. We did this in collaboration uh, with a number of labs. I want to mention the Gladyshev lab, Horvath lab, uh, and the company Zymo. Now we can ask, are these mice actually older based on the DNA methylation clock? And you can see that they are. So this is on average, these mice are 50% older than the mice of the same age. Now the clock requires these TET enzymes, uh, which remove the methyl. So that's important for later. Remember, TET enzymes, there are three of them. They are important for moving DNA methylation. So let's finish the talk uh, in the next seven minutes or less. Can you turn the clock back? Can you get those balls to go back into the valleys they came from? In other words, can you polish the CD? Now, we saw on the shoulders of Sinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize in 2012, and also we were inspired by uh, Juan Carlos Belmonte and his postdoc, um, uh, Dr. Campa, I can't remember his first name, but they published a paper in 2016 that was quite remarkable. Now, before I show you that data, the person who deserves a lot of credit for this work uh, is our graduate student, um, Wan Feng Lu. And Wan Feng came to my lab trying to reverse aging, starting with old skin cells. And he kept working on it, and it failed, and he turned these skin cells into tumor or tumorigenic cells. It just wasn't working. Uh, but actually, we and he didn't have the gut to do what they did in the Belmonte lab, which was to take a transgenic mouse that had all four Yamanaka factors, right? all four of these that we use, obviously, to turn somatic cells into IPSCs, and say, what would happen if you do this to an animal? Um, and as expected, over two days, those mice died. It's pretty bad. This is not going to be a therapy anytime soon. But what they did was pretty brave. They said, okay, let's just, after two days, let them recover for another five days, and then we'll hit them again with those Yamanaka factors. And that cycle of being almost dead and then back alive led to the extension of lifespan in a premature aging model, which is a hutchinson gilford syndrome model. And uh, you can actually see, compared to the prematurely aged mice, the ones that were hit with DOC uh, look substantially healthier. So we took a page out of their book and we said, well, maybe what we're missing is uh, that we need to get rid of this toxicity. So what one chain decided to do was to, instead of keep, keeping on using uh, the four Yamanaka factors, he instead made a virus that had only three of them, OX4, SOX2, and KLF4 in a cistron that just fit inside a small AAV that we've modified to be exquisitely sensitive to um, TET or, or uh, or doxycycline, okay? And we can have TET off or TET on, and there's one thing. So one thing had, had done this in cell culture. Um, he's a brave guy, he went straight into mice, and he said, I want to do this in neurons. And I said, neurons, that's about the hardest thing you can do. And he said, no, trust me on this. If you look at a, an embryonic nerve, it'll grow in the dish, it'll recover, but an adult neuron won't. What if we could take adult nerve cells and make them regrow. And that's what he did. He, we teamed up with Ji Gang, he's lab at Children's Hospital, and Ji Gang is expert in using optic nerve crust as a model for CNS rejuvenation, regeneration. And they pinched the optic nerve, so the eye is here and the brain is down here. And this is a stain that tells you how many nerves have survived. And you can see many of them have died off after this was about two weeks later. But the ones where we turned on the three of the four Yamanaka factors, we've left off C-MIC, C-MIC being the oncogene, 
Uh, that didn't take a genius to figure out that wasn't healthy. But what we showed, what he found, was that these nerves started to grow back. And the longer we leave these mice, the better the growth. In fact, we can see nerves um, innovating the brain the longer we leave it. So that was a bit of a breakthrough. It didn't mean that they were aging or reverse aging, but I'll show you later that we think that's true. So next we teamed up with the lab of Bruce Cassandra. He's an expert in glaucoma. I won't go through it because I want to get to the punchline, but basically you put pressure in the mouse's eye, and then you can turn on, after the damage, you turn on the OSK transgene. Uh, we're just delivering it in the eye. You can do that to patients. Spark Therapeutics, for example, does this to correct genetic diseases. So this isn't crazy medicine. And um, what we see is that the, before we turn on the gene therapy, the neuronal firing of the retina is pretty bad. But after we've turned it on, and this is uh, four weeks later, you get back the axon potential. And if you test eyesight, uh, they've met, some of them have regained their full eyesight. Uh, some of them are pretty good. One of them didn't respond. But on average, the mice are much better at seeing. So there's nothing right now that can reverse vision loss due to glaucoma. And this, we hope, will be the first. So what about regular old mice? If you just put regular old mice in front of a moving screen, uh, these are 12 months old. They lose their eyesight pretty early. And they don't move their head. So we took these old mice. We gave them the gene therapy, turned it on for a few weeks. And now these mice, in every case, could see again. And you can tell this not just by measuring the pulses at the back of the eye, but you can see in this case this mouse is actually starting to see those lines again. And actually, when you quantify this, their eyesight is just as good as a young mouse. Again, it doesn't prove it has anything to do with aging. So let me give you a few slides to show you. So one thing did gene expression, whole genome only seek. Now, if there was no change in gene expression with the treatment, all the genes would sit on the horizontal. If it was making aging worse, it would look like this. And if it reversed aging, it would look like this. This would be a home run, because consider that genes that go down with aging a lot, down here in this quadrant, would have to go up a lot with the treatment. And the cell would have to know somehow that the gene that went down a lot would have to go up a lot. Or if it went down a little bit, it would go up a little bit. In other words, is there an observer of youth in the neurons? And the answer, I think, is pretty clear. Yeah, there's a backup copy of the epigenome in the eyes of these mice. It's not a perfect result, but that's pretty good. Um, and what's interesting about these red dots is that these are sensory-related genes. These are actually more related to smell and taste. Now, what they're doing, going down with aging and being restored with our treatment, we really have no idea, but we could speculate, but that's uh, for future work. And finally, what about the clock? Okay. So we have an in vitro assay. Uh, this is uh, Charles Chan did this work. If you do this in vitro and damage neurons, these are human neurons, not mouse, the OSK expression allows them to recover just like young neurons would. But here's the important result. This doesn't happen if you get rid of the, de the DNA demethylase. Tip 1 and Tip 2 are required for this recovery to happen, and that's also true for vision. You don't get the vision recovery if you don't have a DNA demethylase. What about the clock? Well, they get younger. If you look here, uh, what's this one? This is... This is in vitro, but we've also done in vivo. Uh, the clock goes backwards, and it doesn't happen as efficiently when you lack the DNA demethylase. And here shows that you need the test to be able to restore vision of these old mice. All right, so what have I told you? I told you that aging might be epigenetic, that it's driven by DNA breaks, and probably other things, but a large driver is DNA breaks, so we can talk maybe later about how to avoid DNA breaks as much as you can. But here's a take-home message. Maybe the epigenetic clock isn't just a measure of age, but it's intimately involved in determining how healthy you are and may even regulate it. And this is my last slide. This is Shannon's uh, schematic, but I've now made it biological. A young cell or an embryo 
has the perfect epigenetic information due to noise, which is in part due to DNA damage, DNA breaks. You have the loss of information at the epigenetic level. These are old cells. And what I've just shown you is that by using Yamanaka factors and calling up the PET enzyme, you can tell the observer to reset the cell to be young again. Now, we don't know exactly where the correction data is held. I cannot tell you today what the information backup hard drive is. Is it a DNA modification or a protein that sits on the genome for our whole lives? We're looking for it. We don't know what it is yet. Um, but I have a lot of people to thank along the way. I've mentioned a lot of people. Um, mostly, I really want to give a shout out to George Church's lab and Noah, who helped us with the AAV delivery and the vectors, um, the clock guys, Zigan, uh, who helped us a lot with the, the nerve crush. Um, and Bruce and Meredith Wesley Cassandra did a lot of the glaucoma work, and people in their lab um, have been wonderful. Uh, I just want to also mention George Murphy, who has been a great collaborator on the skin, um, and Conrad Blatt, who's been helpful with OSK resetting. Um, and there are a lot of people along the way that I won't read out, uh, just to put them up on the screen, because they deserve a, a mention. And thanks to the funding agency, and thank you for inviting me. I'll take questions. Uh, so it appears that um, if you do it for a long time and you do it at a high level of expression, you will erase the, the DNA methylone and go back to age zero. We don't do that. We have three of the four Yamanaka factors. We induce them slightly, and we only do it for a certain amount of time. You might ask, well, isn't that dangerous? Uh, well, in the mice, we've had those genes turned on for a year in the eye and in the whole body. Admittedly, we can't infect every cell in the body, but we haven't seen any evidence of xenogenesis at this point, which is very different than if you turn on all four of them. But there's a barrier, seemingly, that, that the cells know that this is where you should stop. You can push through that barrier, but I've been surprised how safe it is that the cells only go back to a certain point and not further. And uh, I think it might be an ancient mechanism. Jellyfish use it, salamanders use it, um, and I think we're tapping into that. So then in the camera, it's a crop, so you can do that. You can do that. You You Species that live a long time, if I were right, this theory is right, should have a much more stable like the genome and perhaps repair DNA better or have less disruption or get their proteins to go back to where they came from. Um, it looks like that's the case. Now, some of the best work is from Vera Gorbanova, who you'll hear shortly. Um, we found that uh, 56 and we found 51 in mammals that's repairing those DNA breaks. And that if you have more of them, you have a more stable genome and a more stable epigenome. And she just had a cell paper last year from Xiao, who I mentioned, who's now in my lab, fortunately, uh, that species that live a long time have more active frequencies and also a more stable epigenome. So there are studies naked mole rats. She sees that their epigenome is more stable under perturbation and for a uh, length of time. But why? I mean, it's probably not all the two in the way, there's a lot more to figure out. 
And one thing we're doing in my lab as a graduate student is working on uh, putting genes from either long-lived species or very special distant species like tardigrades or radiotoxicurans into human cells to see if we can A, make their epigenome more stable uh, and also check the cycle. So do you think that there's a connection between the accessibility of the particular locus and whether or not that attracts these proteins to that region? That's why it's really Yeah, yeah. So I hope you all heard questions. Why are these the hot spots? Is this only? Uh, we don't know that. Uh, what we're trying to do now with this new technology is drill down and say what's special about these regions that make them susceptible. Um, I will tell you that what's important is we've, we've used other enzymes to cut the genome. ISC1, for example, will give the same type of uh, changes. Hops will come on. So it's not where it's cutting, it's the fact that it was cut previously, which is good news for the model. Um, but why these hot spots are hot, we don't know. What I can tell you if you're wondering is the regions around the cut site look totally normal. They reset. It's other regions, probably, that are losing proteins during the DNA repair pro process. That's my guess, and that they don't fully reset. As if you've opened up a present and we gifted it a million times, it doesn't look pretty at the end. I have a question about the uh, can you compare like, the So I'm wondering uh, what about the dimethylation and the model? Yeah. Um, yeah, what about other, other marks? Um, if I had another million dollars, I'd do more. It's very expensive, as you can appreciate, but that's no excuse. We've, we've done H3, uh, K4 monomethylation. And, uh, but other than that, we, we want to delve into these other marks because it might be that they will tell us why these are hotspots. So it's a really good question. And we also want to map, and we, we're doing this now, where are the clock sites? And are the clock sites relevant to these hotspots? Yeah. Right, canine acetylation is important. It's also a target of cert one, uh, so it's a really good question. We haven't done that, but it's a good, good point. So we're going to move to room 113. We'll be the room, and we'll room 113, and people can